So hi, Danusha, and welcome, welcome on our podcast today. Hi, Ellie. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. It's really great to, to have you here. I'm happy we found some time to speak. Um, so just to start, maybe you can introduce yourself and just, yeah, um, explain who you are and what it is that you do. So my name's Danusha Francis. I'm 26 years old. I'm a gymnast. I compete for Jamaica. Um, I was on the UCLA gymnastics team and before I competed for Jamaica, I used to compete for Great Britain. Um, and in 2019 at the World Championships, I qualified to compete at the Tokyo Olympics. So hopefully it all goes ahead next year and you'll see me waving the Jamaican flag at the Olympics. Yeah, that's awesome. First of all, congratulations on that. I obviously Thank want to you. speak a bit <laughs> more about that later as well, but that's... Uh... Yeah, that's amazing. You truly have this story of, you know, someone who had a dream for so long and just never, never gave up on it. So that's super cool, really. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, but if we just start at the beginning, when did you first start with gymnastics and why did you get into it? So I just started gymnastics as a hobby. So um, I've got, f there's four of us, um, so three siblings, um, but three of us are back to back in age. I'm in the middle. Um, and so my mum had a lot of energy to deal with when we were <laughs> little children. So she took us to loads of different activities after school um, and gymnastics happened to be one of them. And I just loved it. As soon as I entered the gym, saw the girls doing cartwheels and backflips and I was like, yes, I need to be able to do every <laughs> single thing possible. And I just didn't turn back from that first day. And luckily, um, my mum especially, but my whole family was so supportive. And um, when they realised how... Uh, much I wanted to pursue my dreams in the sport and um, that I had some talent they were always behind me um, whether that was like time money like everything they could do for, to help me pursue my dreams they did so I think that's a massive help because obviously if you're in it alone I don't know if it's quite mm -hmm. possible to to get to your dreams yeah absolutely I can imagine that has a big impact on you and while you're while you're able to do that support from your family so that's that's awesome and you said then did you play any other sports as well or was it just gymnastics from the beginning gymnastics all the way um when I was really little we did like ballet and just like little things like that um <laughs> after school clubs and then just during school I was on some of my school teams um athletics netball um but I didn't take any of them quite to the same level um those <laughs> were just more for fun and just like yeah just for my school Okay, okay. And do you remember then at what moment when you were doing gymnastics that you were thinking, okay, you know what, this is something that I want to do at the highest level, like I want to become an elite gymnast. Do you know when that was that you were thinking that? Um, so I'd been doing it for about a year. So I was about six when the 2000 Olympics was on TV. And I remember watching it. And then I think that was probably like my first introduction to the Olympics. And seeing mm -hmm. gymnastics on TV was like brand new to me. <coughs> and um there was a gymnast called Elena Zamolodikova from Russia, and she was amazing. And her sass and her charisma was something that I just loved about her. And I just wanted to be like her and compete at the Olympics. So I think that was when the dream became a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so that was at a young age then that you, you know, started thinking about that. Um, it was, yeah, very young that it became a, a dream for you. <laughs> Yeah, and I think looking back, there's something so just innocent and like, um, I didn't realise how big of a dream that was, so to speak, at that age. Obviously, I'm sure my mum was sort of laughing in the background, <laughs> like, yeah, you're going to go to the Olympics. Um, and obviously going through the ranks in Great Britain and realising, okay, this could actually be a mm. thing that I can make a reality. Um, yeah, I think that was, as you get older and you realise, wow, this is actually a huge accomplishment if I can pull it off. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes more daunting when it becomes more realistic. But um, yeah, it's quite nice to just think back to that moment, that six-year-old watching the TV, and then next year I'll actually get to make that dream a reality um, sort of 20 years later. Yeah, that's crazy. That's so cool, really. And like you said, it becomes more real, of course, as you get older, because as a kid it's easy to you know, have these dreams and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go go and do this, I'm going to go and do that. Yeah. But then to actually make that a reality, that's, yeah, that's super cool. Um, and after, you know, competing internationally, you represented Great Britain, as you said, growing up in your teenage years. Um, then after that, in 2013, you actually went to the US to um, study and to be a gymnast for UCLA. So was that something that you always had in mind that you would do? 
Um, so no, it wasn't something that I really knew about. I don't think there was that much exposure before I went. So um, I knew a couple of friends that had gone out there, but it still wasn't like that well known. Um, and it was my mum that sort of put the suggestion to me. But I was always going to sort of stop gymnastics in 2012 because I was like, I'm 18. I've been doing it my whole life. I'm going to step into my adult world and like close that chapter. That's why I always thought, obviously now <laughs> that sounds funny, but um yeah, so then when the thought of doing gymnastics for four more years was like, oh, I wasn't super keen. Obviously, it's like tough on your body as well. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not always like highs. There's obviously lows as well. So I wasn't sure. And obviously, you step into a whole new system. But my mum was like quite adamant that I should at least think about it. And obviously, I knew I could get a degree out of it. And um, it did look cool. But I still wasn't super sold on the idea. And then I'd mm-hmm. heard of UCLA, like as this famous university, but I didn't even know anything about their gymnastics team um, or their coaches or anything like that. So, but just to sort of um, amuse my mum, I was like, oh, I'll go if I can get a scholarship to UCLA. Just kind of thinking it was so <laughs> out of my reach, but just okay. to act like I was going along with her idea. Um, so then she was just on like a message board online and just said, uh, my daughter's Denise Francis, does anybody know if she has a chance to get into college? Like she especially likes UCLA. Um, and then like a few people got back to her and said I know the coach at UCLA or I know the coach at somewhere else and then they contacted the coaches and then the coaches then um, contacted me so then one of them being uh, Miss Val from UCLA and I was like okay (laughs) what my mum got me into (laughs) then obviously I had to stick to my word and um, when I got invited on a recruit trip to UCLA that was when I was like okay wow this is amazing like I'd be silly Mm -hmm. to not take up this opportunity And maybe me saying to my mum, I'll only go if I can go to UCLA was me manifesting it. And it all (laughs) paid off in the end because those four years were just unreal, like like a whole movie. And I just feel like I became the best version of myself as a gymnast, but also just grew into myself 100 percent, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was going to say, because obviously, you know, you had a really good time there. Um, you did a lot of good things uh, in terms of gymnastics as well. You became a six time All-American and the 2016 National Co-Champion on beam. So you did accomplish a lot on the gymnastics side. But how did it, you know, how do you think it helped you grow as a person as well? You know, being away from your family, moving so far away and just focusing all your time into studies and, and gymnastics. Um, I think that's the only time in life where you have so many people that just want to help you and just want you to be the best version of yourself that you can be. Mm-hmm. Like if you're struggling in school, there's someone you can turn to. If you've got an injury, there's someone you can turn to. Um, if you're struggling with your mental health, there's someone you can turn to. And it's obviously there are those things in life, but they're just so accessible. And you just feel like every single person or team of people in each aspect really wants you to be the best. And I just think... It's just such a cool, um, when I look back now, I'm just like, wow, that's so incredible and like so lucky to have experienced that. Because obviously when you get into your adult world, yeah, if you are suffering mm-hmm. from something, you have to seek out that help. And uh, when you're growing up as a child at school, same thing. Um, and even competing on um, Great Britain on the national team, um, mm-hmm. not all of that is available and just definitely not as accessible anyway. So I just think it's just such a, amazing opportunity the facilities and the people and it's just gives you everything you need to thrive in the classroom whether you want to do um, other things volunteering or if you um, like I was interested in doing tv presenting so I got to host a youtube um, series when I was there so yeah they just give you everything they can to help you thrive yeah it's a good opportunity and like you say a good support system as well yeah massively but obviously, because um, I've been to the US as well, and I went to college yeah. there, so I know, like you said, it's sometimes it's kind of like a movie with everything going on, and there's a lot of things. So, you know, obviously you have sports, you have school, but there's a lot of partying, hanging around with friends. Was that something that you found like difficult to manage, like balance when you were there, or were you super focused into gymnastics and just putting all your time and effort into that? Um, no, I've always been someone that enjoyed like having a life outside of gymnastics as well um so obviously in England like sort of the drinking age is 18 but everyone starts a bit younger so (laughs) I was really going out and stuff before college Um, and then obviously in America it's um 21 but found my ways and I had a good social life um (laughs) and 
I've just, I've been very lucky. I'm very good at time management and I'll definitely make sure I've got everything I need to done before I go out and I don't prioritise partying over um, gymnastics or school Mm -hmm. or any of my other responsibilities. But it's definitely something that I know, like, for me, I enjoy it. So I'm not going to just say not doing that because I want to be a gymnast or I want to get A's. I feel like I can do it all. So I tried my best (laughs) to do it all and I would say I succeeded. (laughs) Yeah, of course, you were able to get, you know, to enjoy a bit of everything, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And sometimes, like, you look back and you say, oh, maybe if I um, didn't have as much of a social life, could I have been a slightly better gymnast? And yeah, maybe. But when I look back, it's like those memories that I also remember over sort of a score that I got or a place that I came in a competition. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely don't regret um, having a good social life. (laughs) No, you want to remember, like, everything, I guess everything that you got to experience so yeah definitely and LA was just like amazing for that too um so many crazy stories and everything that's awesome really (laughs) that's so cool (laughs) and um as well I wanted to say because whenever you were in college actually you you said before you were representing Great Britain and then in college you made a change to represent Jamaica instead um what you know led up to to this choice um to to switch and represent Jamaica um, so Great Britain's obviously a really competitive team. Um, so to stay on their national team, I would have to travel back to do trials and to attend national squads. Um, so living in LA, um, obviously this just wasn't feasible. And then obviously at the same time, you might still not make the team. So there's a lot of money that I would have to um, mm-hmm. pay to get there and back. And then obviously maybe not making the team. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to compete without all that um yeah that hassle kind of thing so seeing um the opportunity to compete for Jamaica I saw that um one other girl was doing it and she was also in college so um I was like okay so if she can do it then hopefully I can do it so we reached Mm -hmm. out to her and her mum and her family and they were really helpful and helped me to get my citizenship and everything like that um and yeah I'm also half Polish so I did think about (laughs) representing Poland but um, I just love Usain Bolt, so when I got the chance to be on his team, I had to take it. <laughs> so that was quite a big influence as well, just looking up to him as an as an idol and, and wanting to be on his team as well. Yeah, definitely. And then the other thing was that there's, there was obviously hardly any history on the Jamaican team. So going forward, um, we've been able to make history almost every single time we've gone out to compete and then... With doing that, we've been able to motivate and inspire young gymnasts. And um, just last year, they opened the first national facility and I was able to be there at the opening. And so just to be a part of all that is just something really, really special. So, yeah, I think it's been the correct decision for me, definitely. Um, And it's allowed me to carry on gymnastics and make my dream come true, but also inspire so many young kids and hopefully a future sort of world or Olympic champion from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of, it's helped you to also give back and be part of something bigger than just, yeah. just your career. Yeah, exactly that's, that. Yeah, that's really great. And I wanted to ask, because both, you know, representing first Great Britain and then um, Jamaica now, what does it mean to you to be able to, you know, represent your country at really the highest level in, in elite gymnastics? Yeah, I think you start to just not take it for granted, because I definitely don't, but you get used to it. So then when you kind of get older and you can see it from like the broader perspective and you're like, wow, like I've represented, well, I've represented two countries now. Um, and yeah, it's just not many people get to say they've done that. And it's just, yeah, I'm just so proud. And I can't wait to tell my future kids and grandkids. And um, yeah, I just feel so proud. And I'll be so, so proud um, at the Olympics next year. I think the way that Jamaica's embraced me um, and I've been able to sort of fly the flag on the gymnastics stage next year will just be like the pinnacle of my career and just hopefully like a massive thank you to all the support I've had from um, Jamaicans. Yeah, yeah, we're really looking forward to to that when the Olympics come around finally. Yeah, finally. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. And um, like you uh, like you said before, in you went to college and then in 2016 you actually did take a break from gymnastics so I wanted to ask you kind of what was it that happened at this time in your life because you took a break I think it was almost one and a half years that you didn't um yeah compete in gymnastics and then after that you decided to come back and compete again so kind of what happened and what made you find your way back to to elite gymnastics 
Um, so I graduated in 2016, so it was just like the natural step. Like most people, when they graduate from gymnastics at college, you retire. It's a young sport, and like um, you don't have that professional league like for other sports. You do college, then you go on to be a pro, but it's not the same in gymnastics. So yeah, it just felt like the natural thing. All the other girls in my year across the country, not just at UCLA, were pretty much all um, retiring. So it didn't even cross my mind that I wouldn't. And um, I fully embraced retirement. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I was living with my sister, um, working. And, but I always um, was staying in the gymnastics world. I was doing workshops um, across the UK um, for gymnasts. And then I was also doing just a bit of coaching one-on-one. And, oh, and then also recreational coaching. And there was one week where I was coaching at my gym and just loads of people randomly asked me if I was going to make a comeback. And I was like, what? I was thinking, why are they all asking me this? <laughs> and it literally hadn't crossed my mind, like not once. Like I was like working out here and there at the gym, but nothing to do with gymnastics. I wasn't trying to stay in shape, nothing like that. Um, and then I just started to think about it. And I was like, well, my body's fine. Like I didn't have any sort of long lasting injuries. My mind's fine. I was not traumatized or anything like that. I know a lot of gymnasts um, have suffered from some bad experiences in the sport but I've been lucky mm-hmm. not to and um, there was nothing really stopping me maybe a bit of pride of like I'd just graduated as balance beam champion did I want to step back into it and <laughs> maybe not be as good so I did think about it and I was like I could give the Olympics one more shot having missed out so narrowly in 2012 and 2016 mm-hmm. but also the set at the same time like do you want to give something a shot where you have missed out twice again that's a bit of pride that's a bit of like the fear of failure um but I just thought okay let me go for commonwealth first um and just give it a go and you don't have to if you start and it's not working out I don't have to carry on so first I messaged my mum and she's like supportive but she was like it's your decision like you're a full-grown adult now like you've got your degree like whatever you want to do is up to you and then I emailed my coaches they thought I was a bit crazy but again they're like very <laughs> supportive um and so yeah then I just took that sort of leap of faith moved house to go back near my gym and um just went for it and just was really dedicated for the first few months like it was very hard on my body felt like I'd been hit by a car every morning when I was first (laughs) getting back into it It because literally in that year and a half off I didn't do I didn't do any arms (laughs) I just did a bit of legs and like (laughs) was not in shape um definitely not in gymnastic shape um but then once I got into it and I was like, okay, I got my skills back and I just sort of got my got into it again. And um, the Commonwealth, they decided to only send one gymnast for Jamaica. So they sent one of the guys. And obviously where I'd taken a year and a half off, I couldn't really expect to be taken over him. I did try to argue that they should take a girl as well, but mm-hmm. it didn't work out. But then I'm still training. At this point, I'd got all my skills back. Um, so I was like, okay, I've just got to sort of suck it up and admit that I want to go for the Olympics. Um, and it it's quite hard to sort of say these things out loud um, and to, to tell my coaches, okay, like, Commonwealth's been and gone. I'm still training. So really, I'm here to train for the Olympics, go for it for a third time. So, yeah. That's kind of how you got your, your way back. <laughs> yeah. So just a coincidence, really. But I do feel like it yeah. was um, meant to be in the long run, especially now being able to look back and obviously having finally achieved my goal. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned there as well, I wanted to ask you that because you mentioned you narrowly missed out on the Olympics two times before. So in 2012 um, and in 2016, then yeah, first time representing um, Great Britain and then Jamaica. So how, I mean, because you said it's a lot of pride. How did you deal with that those two first times, like whenever you were so close to making it, but you still didn't get to compete? How did you just deal with those those moments? Yeah, so in 2012, I was reserve. So this... um, at the time, it kind of still felt like failure. And the time when it didn't feel like a failure was when I was in America. Um, they treat you like you're an Olympian when you're a reserve. So obviously I mm-hmm. went in in September of 2012. So they were having loads of like Olympian celebrations and like honoring Olympian events. And I was invited to all of them. And I was like, they do know I was reserve, like thinking like, just, I literally like told them a few times that like, I was just reserve. And they're like, yeah, that's amazing. And I was like, oh, yeah, it actually is an incredible achievement. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool for me to kind of process it in a different way. Because um, I do feel like at the time, Great Britain made, there's there's three or four of us that reserves. didn't They made us feel like we'd failed, honestly, um, to put it out there bluntly. Um, 
And so, yeah, it was hard at first, but I did actually end up having an amazing summer. The, the Olympics was in London, so I was, got to be a part of it. I was performing with Cirque du Soleil at the opening of each of the gymnastics competitions. So that was pretty okay. special in its own in its own way. So mm-hmm. in the end, that all turned out okay. And then 2016 was when I'd first um, changed to Jamaica. So 2015 at the World Championships was the qualifying mm-hmm. event to the test event. And I qualified, um, but the Jamaicans decided to let another gymnast go to the test event, um, gymnast that I'd beaten. Um, and obviously I'd qualified the spot. So mm-hmm. everything was kind of out of my control and that just kind of stung a bit. Um, and I guess the way that I got over that one was because I was still at UCLA and still had the national championships to do. And I guess winning the national balance beam championship uh, made everything okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, that one. Yeah, I guess just it's life, isn't it? There's going to be highs, yeah. there's going to be lows. And it's the way you deal with those lows. Um, If you want to carry bitterness around or, I don't know, bad energy, then it's just going to affect the rest of your life. So, yeah, you've just got to let things go if you can't control them. Yeah, exactly. And at the end of the day, everything kind of figures itself out. Because like you said, now, today, you, you have already qualified for the Tokyo Olympics and you are going to, you know, with... Obviously, the delay and everything, but um, yeah, with the Tokyo Olympics coming up soon, um, you will be be there. So that's amazing. Whenever you, you know, competed at the Worlds and you found out that you qualify, what was like going through your mind? Um, competing was really nerve wracking because it was like I knew I could qualify if I did mm-hmm. um, good routines. But obviously, like you have to do them. And so the nerves yeah. were really high. Um so yeah, it was really nerve wracking. And then finding out I qualified, I was in um, Marrakesh in Morocco on holiday because I just left the World Championship straight away because I just kind of wanted to be like away from the situation in case okay. it was bad news, I think. I just wanted to be like in a good environment. Um, but it was good news. And yeah, it was pretty cool. I was getting phone calls from all the Jamaican news outlets and they were wanting to interview me and stuff like that and it just kind of felt surreal because I was like on holiday like <laughs> by the pool on the phone doing yeah. interviews um and I don't think it will fully sink in till I'm finally there and I see like the Tokyo logo the Olympic rings and I've got my Jamaican flag on and um yeah I think it's just been such a long time coming that it won't fully sink in till I'm there I don't think yeah until it's truly happening yeah yeah I can imagine. And um, with this big, you know, pandemic, obviously, this year, the Olympics yeah. have been delayed. So how has this impacted you, you know, for your gymnastics or your private life, like in general? Um, have you managed to find any positives at all with this delay of one year? Yeah, um, I think the positives are definitely like being able to, well, when we've been training at home, you can focus on like small details. You can uh, focus on small injuries and getting them stronger. And then, mm-hmm. um, and then back in the gym, um, you've got another year to work on any um, new skills you might want to do. And then I've got a new routine now. Um, and then me and my coach just have a little countdown going. So yeah, we're trying to make it fun and light. And I think also like the positive is that it hasn't been cancelled. So that's the main positive, um, especially after all this time and finally being able to um, say I'm going. I don't want it to be cancelled um so yeah that's the main positive and like that keeps me motivated each day obviously there's times when I'm like oh I could I could be retired right now that might be nice and starting the next chapter of my life um Mm -hmm. but then I also think everything happens for a reason and even though this pandemic's a horrible situation um I think it's been a time for like reflection and growth for a lot of people uh, myself included so um yeah, so there's definitely been some positives. Yeah, that's good. Finding at least something, um, obviously, because yeah. it's a it's a full year, so you have to find something, like you said, to keep you motivated and to keep you going. Um, and with you know the Olympics coming up, and obviously your focus is on that. What is would you say like kind of your approach going into the Olympic Games? Ooh. Um, well, for me, I know I'm sort of not a top three contender or anything like that. So my approach going in is definitely just to have fun and also just to try and show my best gymnastics and just make everybody proud um so obviously they say anything can happen like mm-hmm. <laughs> but I just kind of know where I am in the ranks and I know that um I can still be Jamaica's best Olympian 
um, if I pull off a good performance, obviously um, I'll be the second ever Olympian for gymnastics for Jamaica. So regardless, I'm making history, which is amazing, but hopefully I can pull us up the ranks from um, the performer that went last time. And yeah, just make everybody proud. And um, especially like people that have just been behind me for so long, my coaches, my mum, uh, my sisters and brothers. Yeah, so that's the main aim for me. Yeah, and like you said as well, I mean, just getting there and being there, I guess, soaking up the moments and everything is, I mean, making history already by, by being there. So that's super cool. Yeah, definitely. And um, we spoke a bit before as well, you know, like you've achieved a lot of things, both um, as an elite gymnast representing um, your country, but also on a college level. So what would you say, you know, aside from all of the actual like achievements and awards, what would you say that success means to you? Is it, you know, doing what you love, the traveling or what is it that that it means to you? I think, oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I think success means to me being able to do what you love. And if you mm -hmm. can do what you love and also inspire others, um, I think that's like amazing. I think that's sort of like something that you don't go into gymnastics to think you can be a role model or to think you can inspire others. So if you're loving okay. doing it and you're able to inspire others, I think that's sort of what I would call success. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. And I guess as well, when you're, when you can tell that someone loves what they're doing, that's, that's already an inspiration in itself, you know, watching someone doing that. So that, that definitely makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It does. And looking at your career and everything that you've achieved so far, everything you've been through, do you have like, a favorite moment I don't know if it's when you qualified for Olympics if there are any other moments that are like your favorites that you you know cherish cherish Ooh. a bit extra <laughs> um it's so hard to compare them because I just feel like I have like three mm -hmm. phases of my career like competing for Great Britain competing at UCLA then competing for Jamaica um okay so can I pick one from each <laughs> yeah of course okay. of course go ahead <laughs> So with Great Britain, it was definitely 2011 Worlds when we qualified a team to the 2012 Olympics. It had been mm -hmm. like quite a grueling um, process to get selected for the team. And then um, we were at a training camp for about six weeks beforehand. And then like at that point, we were ranked around eighth and you had to come in the top eight. So it was like we had to do a great competition. So for us to all um, mm -hmm. do well on the day and all our hard work to pay off um, was just such a rewarding feeling. Um, so that's definitely the one for that phase. Um, and then mm -hmm. UCLA, mm -hmm. um, a, me a memory that always sticks out to me is my senior year at Pac-12. We hadn't won the Pac-12 championships um, any of my other years. And this year we like knew we had it in us and it all came down to like the last routine and just mm -hmm. everyone's holding hands, cheering for, her name was Sadiqa, um, doing her floor routine. And we, she's our best floor worker. We knew she could do it, but obviously you never know in sports anything can happen. We're screaming our hearts out and like she just killed it. And just the feeling of like so many people just wanting this same thing and for it to all happen at, at the same time, just such wow. an amazing <laughs> feeling. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, a similar feeling at Nationals that year as well. Um, although we didn't win, like, we really just did our very best and, like, everyone pulled off all their routines. And, yeah, it was just a really nice close-knit team that year too. Um, so to also be, like, one of the older ones and leading the team, mm -hmm. such a cool feeling. Um, and then with Jamaica, it definitely has to be qualifying for the Olympics. And then I would also say Pan Ams was, like, an amazing um, experience last year. Um, mm -hmm. I was able to make the beam and the all-around finals. So I was the first gymnast to ever make any sort of finals at an international competition for Jamaica. Um, and those were like two massive like personal goals for me as well. So that was really cool. And I think that definitely gave me that last little push of confidence then going into the world championships um, okay. that qualified me to the Olympics. So both of those two. I think obviously qualifies the Olympics that like slightly, slightly pips it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the biggest one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but that's cool. Of course, it's difficult to choose. I can imagine, like you said, it's three different like kind of faces and so many yeah. things that you've been through. Yeah, and I feel like, so. yeah, and I was like a child and I was like a young adult and now I'm like a mm -hmm. proper adult. <laughs> yeah, different levels. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For sure. And uh, apart from, you know, what we spoke about before and narrowly like missing, the, missing out on the Olympics two times before now qualifying, um, what would you say are some other like challenges that you've had to face throughout your career? It could be like injuries or maybe like mental barriers, um, stuff like that. Um, in 2010, 
um, with Great Britain at the World Championships. The Commonwealth Championships was like back to back with the world. So they selected an A team for the world and a B team for the Commonwealth. So um, Mm -hmm. I made the A team, which was amazing for the world. And so then the Commonwealth was going on and we were still at our like camp before Worlds. And then I got some like virus that I was just being sick and diarrhea, so gross out of both mm-hmm. ends. And just like at that point, I was obviously in really great shape because um, we were going to the World Championships. Um, so when I was sick and diarrhea, lovely, sorry, I don't know why I keep saying it, but <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> it like made me lose loads and loads of weight. Well, not loads, but like a lot for the frame that I was at already. And I just became so weak, like literally overnight and um just had no strength at all and just could not do my routines and we probably had like a week or slightly over a week um before we were going to leave and then I was maybe getting a little bit better but not much and then we're out there in um the Netherlands and the reserve who she competed at the Commonwealth and then came over to Mm -hmm. the Netherlands to join us she came she was like on cloud nine they'd done a great job at the Commonwealth Games and then she was just like looked amazing in training and obviously I'm here like really struggling couldn't do my routines I knew I wasn't gonna um compete in the end because she just looked amazing and it was just the obvious choice like nothing you can do about it I got ill mm-hmm. nobody chose that um and then instead of sort of I thought I was just gonna get taken off to the side and just told like in a gentle way that's what I hoped for but instead I sort of got humiliated in front of the whole team and all the coaches and um, the coaches got asked to like vote who shouldn't compete so even my own coaches there was two of them because there was two of us from the same club there they even had to like vote me off the team and it, it honestly just made me feel like absolutely terrible um, and obviously I've been working for months you work for months to make the team then you for weeks you're yeah. at camp so such a long process this was going to be my first world championships and so I'd gone from like up here just to like crash down and just honestly yeah I just felt humiliated honestly and then um, I remember like leaving the training gym like as I just kept hearing my name and then I don't know if I waited for everyone to say it or if I just left Um, luckily my coach she came after me and she was like obviously really nice and really comforting and um, that made me see like my people that are in my closest circle my personal coaches obviously my family like they're still going to be there for me like no matter what so I think without them or if I'd had like different coaches that didn't treat me like that then I probably would have quit right there and right there and right then because I just felt like horrible in that time um yeah so that was probably the closest I've come to quitting as well yeah so I just think people need to treat make sure they treat people right in in those sort of situations so I know if I go on to coach in the future I definitely wouldn't treat anybody like that yeah no I mean that sounds obviously not nice like you said you've been through all of this working so hard and then at least you expect that you can have a discussion about it like maybe in yeah. private or you can talk in a more gentle way instead of doing yeah, that a bit of, everyone. just a bit of respect really isn't it that's all yeah, you wanted exactly yeah exactly so was that kind of like you said your family and your coaches like your close group that helped you to kind of get past that moment and you know um to not give up because you said that was the closest you've come probably to to giving up yeah, so my um, family wasn't able to be in Rotterdam, um, but my coaches were there and, like, they were just really nice to me the whole, like, rest of the time. And, I mean, they're always nice to me, but, like, just really comforting and just making sure that I wasn't feeling terrible. And uh, all the girls were too, but obviously I kind of felt on my own because now I'm suddenly, like, not competing and just, like, yeah, so it was hard. Um, and, yeah, then when I'm coming, I came back, I still wasn't, like, 100%, like... I really want to carry on this sport because I was thinking Mm -hmm. obviously it's only two years to the Olympics but I've got another world championships next year and and then and then um there might have been like Europeans or something as well so I was like this same thing could happen to me again or I could be made to feel this way in a different way like is it worth it I wasn't sure Mm -hmm. at that point so yeah it was kind of like just my close family and stuff just encouraging me like you've really worked for all these years two to go like you can do it kind of thing luckily that was the only time I was made to feel like that um even when I didn't make the well when I was reserved for 2012 um it wasn't quite as bad as that (laughs) okay that's a good thing at least I mean nobody wants to feel that way obviously especially if it pushes you to almost wanting to give up on something you worked so hard at that's that's not right obviously so yeah 
And um, growing up then, I mean, when you first started, you said that it was when you were six years old that you watched the Olympics and you had um, yeah, this gymnast that you were looking up to. But are there any other people when you were growing up, like who or what was it that inspired you and motivated you to, to work so hard to become an elite gymnast? Um, yeah, I was always a massive fan of a gymnast called Nastia Lukin. Um, I say like okay. she um, she had injuries and stuff like that, and she always like overcame them. And she was the two thousand and eight Olympic all around champion in the end. And like she also mm-hmm. was quite like graceful and elegant and really flexible, but she couldn't do like all the powerful moves. So I always admired how um, her routines were like crafted to suit her strengths rather than following any sort of like treads or or anything like that. So I just thought. And then her performance at the Beijing Olympics was just incredible. Like, even now, if I watch it, it's just, like, mesmerising. Every single thing was so close to perfect. So you can just tell the hours and the dedication that she must have put in leading up to that. Um, Yeah, so I've always admired her. And then now, like, in her post-gymnastics life, I think Mm -hmm. she's still a big inspiration. Um, Yeah, so I definitely would say her. Okay, and later on throughout your gymnastics career, was it anybody else or something else that kind of um, inspired you to keep going, or was she someone that you always kind of looked up to, looked up to um, throughout your career, or did you have any other people that um, were big, um, yeah inspirations to you? Yeah, I think she definitely stands out because then she was the two thousand eight Olympic champion, and then she tried mm. to make a comeback for twenty twelve, and again through injuries and stuff like that. And then she, um, I've heard her do interviews about it since. And she landed on her, well, not on her face, but she like missed the release on bars and you go, you land on your stomach and it's like quite dramatic whenever anyone does it. And this is in the trial and she's obviously the reigning Olympic champion. This is in the Olympic trials and she just felt obviously like devastated and just like maybe embarrassed. I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in her mouth. But then she always describes this as like the first and only time she ever got a standing ovation. And um, it was kind of like she tried and she doesn't regret trying to make that comeback. And then the respect and the admiration from the crowd um, at her trying, I think. And just, um, Mm -hmm. again, I don't want to put words in her mouth. um, But yeah, I think that also kind of inspired me to make my sort of comeback. And um, yeah, and just that gave me that extra little like, if she can do it as the Olympic champion, like and sort of swallow her pride then I can definitely do it. And um, yeah, so I think that's something that I really, really um, admire about her and that kind of inspired me for this latter part of my career. Yeah, exactly. For you doing, I mean, not the exact same thing, but yeah, kind of the same of coming back and everything like that. You can kind of recognize yourself in in what she did probably. Yeah, and then kind of like she didn't make it, but any interviews I've seen, she doesn't regret trying. And then that was kind of like my mindset going into um, aiming for Tokyo. It was like... Would mm-hmm. I regret not trying? Like in the future, would I say to my kids, "Oh, I could have tried to go to the Olympics again, but I didn't bother trying," or would I, or would I say, "I tried, but I didn't make it," or I could even hopefully say, "I tried and I made it." So I was like, I'd rather mm-hmm. say one of the last two. So let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's super cool. And um, I read in an article that you, um, yeah, from an interview that you made quite recently with the Olympic Channel as well that you said the Olympics is my childhood dream and nothing is stopping me and you obviously have this you know never giving up mindset and um, you have this perseverance and determination but where do you think that all of this comes from like where do you find it you know within you is that something you always have with you kind of this mindset or um I think I've been really lucky that I've always had people around me that have encouraged me and they've not sort of like laughed at my dreams like I would say um, the closest people to me, well, everybody that sort of knows about gymnastics, they're well aware that me competing at the Olympics is not going to change my life in terms of, like, I'm not going to become a millionaire. I'm suddenly not going to be able to retire at 27. Um, it's, not, it's nothing like that. But it's just, like, hopefully, I think most people can relate to, like, having that childhood dream and just wanting to mm-hmm. follow it. And I think a lot of the time, people just they can just put it down to, oh, it was a childhood dream, like, it doesn't matter, like, I had other childhood dreams that were definitely, like, silly ones that I, um, I'm definitely not going to pursue, like, becoming a baker, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, <Okay. laughs> being able to, like, follow a dream all the way through, I think has allowed me to, like, I don't know, it just keeps that burning desire 
inside me, I think. Yeah. And I think also, like, knowing that it was within reach, because I think, like, other mm-hmm. dreams you, you can look back and you're like, yeah, that's not actually within reach. Like, maybe being a singer, if you can't sing, it's not within reach. <laughs> I'm not going to be the next Beyonce. But, like, then coming back in 2018, 2019, seeing my ranks um, and seeing it was possible. Um, but I'm quite realistic at the same time. Like, if I'd done the world's... Um, or Pan Ams and just seen like, hey, no, you're just not good enough, then I also would have been realistic with myself. And I think the same thing with my close circle, like my coaches and my and my mum especially, they would have just been able to talk with me and been like, it's not really realistic, like, do you still want to go for mm-hmm. it or not? So I think, yeah, having that close-knit circle that oh, I'll keep it realistic with you, but also encourage you and they don't sort of laugh at your dreams or anything like that. Mm. and knowing it's like you said achievable as well it's not yeah yeah it's not like you couldn't do it <laughs> yeah um, and in in gymnastics in general I mean how important would you say that the mental part is obviously both when you perform because you do a lot of routines that I mean I'm not a gymnast at all I'm not good with any of that type of stuff but it makes me almost a bit stressed watching it sometimes because <laughs> it's it looks a bit scary you know some of the moves that you do so I guess that's a big part of it but also in terms of long-term growth and becoming a good gymnast how important is that mental yeah mental game and men- mentality yeah so important um Gosh, it's obviously the competition is like where you have to be so mentally strong. And like you said, like it's pretty obvious um, that mm-hmm. gymnasts need to be so strong um, psychologically in competition, but also just in training each day, like one little slip up and you can seriously injure yourself. Um, there's even been like deaths. So like the, the stuff you're doing is, is, not, is not safe if you're not mentally ready each time. Yeah. So yeah, every single day you step in the gym, like you need to be honest with yourself. Like if you're a bit tired that day, you need to be thinking what's best to do. Like, should I do a more simple mm-hmm. program? Um, I think you get become more aware of that when you're older as well. Because obviously when you're younger, you can handle a few more slip ups here and there and like bashing <laughs> yourself around a bit more. But when you get older, like every little thing hurts, no matter whether you're doing it right or wrong. So yeah. you don't want to do it wrong too many times. Um yeah so mental strength is definitely something that is huge I think at in college we did a lot with um a team psychologist which was really cool and you compete so Mm -hmm. often at college compared to an elite so I think that really helps me to um like realize like what I needed as a competitor yeah and you have that support as well than having actually someone that's maybe specialized in doing that and helping you to to prepare to compete yeah exactly yeah and it was cool to be a part of a team where people had come from like loads of different backgrounds and like like different levels and because when we would be in our team meetings people would just like offer their advice like hey when I'm doing my beam routine or my floor routine or whatever this is what I think or this is what I do that really helps so it's quite cool hearing from your teammates and then you can try some of their techniques because obviously not everything's going to work for every single person um yeah it was like a nice collaborative um journey and like exercise to do at UCLA that I think definitely benefited me and then obviously now in my career too yeah to find what works well for you I guess yeah yeah and um in another interview as well I um I read that you on this road you know coming back to gymnastics and um, qualifying for Tokyo that you experienced a bit of um, self-doubt on the road um is that something that you ever experienced before um throughout your career was that or was that the first time that that you kind of had those types of emotions um I would say I had more self-doubt like back competing with Great Britain um okay because you're you're always obviously fighting for your place like even more and like there's a bit more there can be like politics involved and stuff like that um and obviously when you're a child like you you just doubt yourself well I don't know but maybe you doubt yourself more in in general but then Mm -hmm. sort of like knowing who I am and the type of gymnast I am especially going through college um, I've definitely had a lot less self-doubt this time round I would say the only time it wasn't I don't know what I said in my other interview but I would say it wasn't sort of self-doubt that I had it was like almost like self-belief and it was just um, believing that I could qualify um, and just being able to say those words out loud like put them down on a vision board and and really just like, admit to myself that I wanted to go for this and wanted to achieve that childhood dream. Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So 
I mean, throughout your career, have you felt a lot of pressure, like um, at times where you felt like, okay, I really do have to perform, I really have to do it now, and you were kind of stressed by that? And if so, how did, how did you deal with those type of emotions going into different tournaments? Um, yeah, there's definitely been times, usually like in trials, or then obviously at UCLA, you're on a team, so every single competition is pressure, because mm -hmm. it's not just you that you'll sort of let down if you make a mistake, you're gonna let down your whole team. Mm -hmm. And these are like your family at that point, like your best friends. So you really don't want to let anyone down. Um, but then when you're competing so often at college, you really learn like what works, like I said. Um, so I think for me, it's kind of like treating it as a performance and just trying to enjoy it rather than like thinking of what it is, if that makes sense. Thinking I'm here to entertain the crowd rather mm -hmm. than like, I need to get this score and I need to like make sure this routine looks a certain way or just trying to enjoy it, trying to entertain the crowd, trying to get the judges on my side um just treating it more like that and I definitely think that I I used to do that a little bit like when I was performing before UCLA but not like intentionally um like I always enjoyed floor and I always enjoyed smiling at the crowd and the judges like from a really young age but then when I was at UCLA and we sort of got told to do that and told to embrace our personalities and to embrace the crowd and embrace the judges And then I kind of was like, oh, okay. And it made it a lot more fun, number one, and like a lot less mm -hmm. stressful. So um, yeah, I would say that's definitely like how I've tried to handle it. Um, and it was really good in Germany um, at the World Championships, which was the qualifier for the Olympics, because the crowd yeah. was really big and the Germans are really supportive um, and their gymnastics seems great. So they're like quite invested. So, and the arena was really cool and like the music. So it was a really nice mm -hmm. atmosphere to, for me to really be my best. Okay. Okay. So you would say then that if you compare to what what your approach and your mindset was when you were younger to where you are now and where you were at the World Championships, you've really grown then and you kind of changed your mindset a bit of how you yeah. how you approach and enter competitions. Yeah, definitely. I think when you're in this sport, and if you don't go to college, then it's never you're never sort of trying to look at it as entertainment. And I, d I don't know if mm -hmm. other colleges do that or whether that's like unique to UCLA or whether there is some FIG elite teams out there that do try and do that. But I do think that like FIG is so intense and like you're always trying to get these scores and these like bonuses and these connections. And it's just like, it's really just intense. I don't even know a better way yeah. to describe <laughs> it. But um, yeah, I just think it sucks the enjoyment out of it. So trying to like change that mindset and because obviously it can be a mindset, like it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I try mm -hmm. to treat it that way. Um, but I even like see the younger ones that I train with at gym. And like, so after lockdown, the we're in lockdown again, but after the first lockdown, yeah. the coaches said to us, we're going to do a mini, like they called it a control comp, but just like you're going to have to show some routines or as close as you can get. Like mm -hmm. obviously they can go in the pit. Like they told us all the rules, like it's not a full on intense competition. Like you can have help, you can do half routines, you can go into the foam. Mm -hmm whatever you want to do but we're going to do that and it was going to be in December and like that was that was that and some of them started crying <laughs> some of them <laughs> they all started moaning they started like fully getting so stressed about it and like to me it was quite amusing they're, they're very young they're like 14 um 13 mm -hmm. yeah yeah 15 16 like that sort of age group where they're very yeah. hormonal and they're like oh, I've got school that day and like I <laughs> just and I was like you guys just need to chill out like Just see it as an opportunity to like put your gymnastics on display, show your hard work. They were going to film it for the parents, like because obviously the parents can't really come into the building at the moment with Corona. Yeah. And um, now with the second lockdown, they they got <laughs> out of it and they're all really happy. But it just like made me think like of the contrast in mindset. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and maybe how you were as well, a bit more like that yeah. when you were younger, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I understand that um, right now, I mean, something that you're more into is kind of this like um, the power of vision boards and, you know, um, positive manifestation. Is that kind of one of your keys to, to getting where uh, to where you are today, you would say? Yeah, definitely. So 2019 just really like made me a believer in like manifestation and vision boards and all of that stuff. Like before I was like, oh, I kind of had the idea of it, but I thought it was a bit gimmicky. And I was like, really like mm -hmm. in writing something down, really make it come true. Um, but I kind of just realized that when you write it down, it's not about making it come true as in like 
a genie and a lamp and making a wish it's more like again like I said before with like self-belief you've written that down now like it's it's in ink and if you see it every day it becomes more normalized to you and you're like yeah I'm gonna qualify for the Olympics rather than like in your head just at the back like this huge dream but this like almost like a burden if it's just in your head but if it's down Mm -hmm. there on paper you see every day it just becomes like a way of life almost um so yeah 2019 like everything I wrote on my vision board came true plus like more so that was like amazing and then well this year not quite the same but I think that was because of the pandemic (laughs) so I'm definitely still a huge believer (laughs) Uh, but I haven't edited my um, vision board I'm I do do them yearly but this year I just thought we'll do it by by yearly if that's the right word so we'll include next year in it because this year is kind of a write-off okay (laughs) yeah of course I haven't tried to do that but you're not the first person who said that they put something down on a vision board and it actually did come true. So I'm thinking that's something that more people should probably try to do, even if they're not athletes yeah. or for just life in general. 100%. Yeah, I'll put on like life goals as well. And then um, also just like little things like I'll just write like my dinner, like family on it. And then like I'll just, if I see that that day, be like, have I checked in with my family this week kind of thing? So just mm-hmm. anything you want. I don't think there's any rules to it. And then as it came closer to any of my goals, specifically my sporting goals, um I rewrote them out and I put them like by my mirror in the bathroom by my mirror in my bedroom um and just like places where I was going to see them just so I was seeing mm-hmm. it even more um just like as it came up to that time um yeah I didn't know if that was like the right thing to do or what but it worked so I'm going to carry on doing that <laughs> yeah and are you saying them out loud as well or it's just writing yeah. it down so for those ones I was I'll be like brushing my teeth and I'll be like I'm going to make the all around final at the Pan American Games um yeah so I just thought I'm just gonna jump right in and like two feet and just try and manifest and do the vision board thing and see if it works and like 2019 just really for me just showed me that it does work um so I think you've got to sort of believe that it's going to work too probably but Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) but now you're going to stick to it obviously (laughs) yeah definitely like 2020 like I said bit of a write-off I don't know if anyone's vision boards came true this year but (laughs) But we'll stick with it. After that. (laughs) Yeah, 2021. We're back on it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I wanted to speak to you a bit about as well, because I understand that in Jamaica, um, gymnastics is kind of like a new and not really a a big sport there. Um, So being where you are today, obviously representing Jamaica now at the highest level in elite gymnastics, do you see yourself as a role model that is able to inspire, you know, um, young gymnasts and um, potentially, you know, girls mostly um, in Jamaica as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, role model is like a big word, um, but I think it comes mm-hmm. in territory. Like you said, like when you're um, achieving things at the highest level in your sport, then the kids are going to look up to you. So um, the most amazing feeling for me was actually getting to go and be at the opening of the National Centre. And I was there just yeah. for the weekend, but um, I did a little performance with the kids and it was just cool just to see their excitement. And then the the main thing that I just love seeing was they had a competition that weekend too. So I was watching and the kids just cheering for each other, like screaming their hearts out. And I just love that. <laughs> in um no in, in elite gymnastics, like it's quite intense and quiet, like um and then college is really like loud, but I loved that. So it was cool to see the Jamaicans just bringing their personalities out and like how you see Usain Bolt is just like how every single one of those little kids were just like <laughs> showing their personalities and just like going for it not holding back and whether they were performing or not they were either like cheering their hearts out or they were performing their hearts out (laughs) and um yeah so to have seen that and just to know that like they're looking up to me um was just such a special feeling um and yeah I'll, I'll feel so grateful in the future and so proud um when there's a Jamaican gymnast on the podium at at Olympics hopefully um and I'll just know that I was kind of like a small small part of that um, would just be a bit of a pinch me moment like to have been at the start of gymnastics in Jamaica of course I mean not I wouldn't say a small piece I would say a big piece um, <laughs> oh, absolutely because that's no that's so important having you know um, maybe for you it's difficult to look at yourself as a role model but the way I see it definitely a role model because you need um, some people that are kind of leading the way and showing you know what can be done just so that when you're younger you can really believe and you can have those dreams as well that, that you spoke about before um, yeah so if they are following you and they are, you know, seeing what you do, looking at your journey, everything that you've done, 
what is the one thing that you hope that they will take with them um yeah from from looking at what you've achieved and what you've done um i hope that they can treat their gymnastics as a performance um and kind of just keep it like keep that kind of aspect of college that i've um hopefully been able to bring to elite and then also Mm -hmm. tony ann um who's the other gymnast for jamaica she was also from college so she kind of had that element to her performances too and then the other girl um kiara she's just starting college so college is kind of like something that all of us have done so we've all got that performance aspect so i think it'll be really cool if jamaica's sort of known um to be the performers of the world of gymnastics and i think that what i saw like i just mentioned with the charisma and the energy Mm -hmm. that they brought (laughs) So their competitions, um, I don't think that will be hard for them to accomplish. And I just think it'll be amazing to see like full teams in the future having like these really charismatic, fun, high energy routines. Um, Yeah, I think that'd be really, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So you kind of already seen a bit of what's what's coming in a few years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And obviously Jamaica's known to like, for like dance hall and to have these cool dance moves so some of them have it already in their floor routines so to see that like evolve and them hopefully be able to perform that way in the world championships in the future will just be amazing yeah yeah of course and um i saw as well on instagram that you're working with this uh company it's a new company i think that's called uh, strong and sassy girls and they do also yeah. these types of like you talked about before with like uh, mission boards and like positive um manifestation and stuff like that yeah do you think that um making this something more normal for young gymnasts do you think that's something that can uh, kind of encourage more girls to maybe stay in gymnastics longer and and uh be more motivated to to keep up with the sport yeah 100 percent. so um when i got first like started talking to strong and sassy um mm-hmm. i was like wow like how amazing i wish i was sort of my eyes were open to vision boards at a young age because obviously i literally mm-hmm. discovered them 2019 <laughs> Yeah. So um, I was thinking if I, that had become like a normal thing for me growing up, then maybe like, I don't know, not to say I would have achieved my dreams earlier, but just to sort of not have them, um, not have any issues with self-belief or not necessarily it's going to completely solve all those, all those little issues. But um, I think it definitely helps and it's a step in the right direction. And it's just a really fun and creative way for them to have their goals and write them down. And I'm sure they won't really feel or know the impact of that till they get older like sort of how we've just had our conversation about it and and like writing it down and stuff like that but for them it's just more of like a fun activity to do but um it's actually going to help them to believe in their dreams believe in themselves and um yeah enjoy it as well and it's just yeah just the packaging and everything I think it's just such a cool um yeah just a cool bit of help for them and I'm just really really excited to be a part of it and yeah I kind of wish like I had something like that growing up too so yeah yeah that's super cool we'll put um yeah the link in the description to to anybody for anybody who wants to check it out to see (laughs) yeah you get um you get a vision board a positivity board and then you also get a goal setting journal so in the journal it's got like short term medium term long term goals Mm -hmm. and it splits it up into all the apparatus and it's also got like mindfulness at the end which I think is amazing just talks about like ways to breathe and just um, things to help you calm down. And then it's also got a colouring section as well, as well as just like quotes and like stickers and just really, really fun for kids, but just actually so much more helpful. Yeah. But they probably won't realise how helpful. Um, but yeah, so the parents can realise how helpful. <laughs> yeah, Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because I'm sure it has a lot to do with it. So it's cool. I guess the the earlier you start, the, the better it is um, eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just to go back a bit about where you are today now, I've heard some mixed things about whether, you know, the Olympic Games is going to be the last competition for your career, if you're going to keep going after. Um, but whenever you do choose to retire from elite gymnastics, um, are you looking to continue coaching, being a choreograph, um, or what is kind of like your plan after, if you have one? <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely always keep my um, foot in the gymnastics world. Um, like at the moment, it's like, well, I do coaching um, recreational, but um, it's mm-hmm. just like freelance when I um, have time to do workshops and choreography um, okay. and then like anything else. Um, so I always think I'll do that. And then I also do a bit of stunt work. So I'll hope to progress in my stunt career um, after um, gymnastics. But then obviously stunts is kind of like a 
thing you have to do when you're able-bodied so then I think once mm-hmm. I finish stunts then I'll go like back into gymnastics more um, and then maybe like I don't know if, I don't know if I can 100% say I'll coach full-time or I'd love to own a gym but I just don't know if I'd be the full-time okay. coach yet so we'll see we'll see okay we'll see um, what yeah, I'd love, I would love to you... own a gym <clears throat> yeah yeah sorry yeah, future, that's cool no that's that's fine no but that's really cool um what is it then that you like about you know doing some coaching as well what is it that's so, um, so fun about it I think I've been so lucky to have amazing coaches my whole career and so just being able to pass on like the ways that they've coached me really fun and just positive and um yeah and then also just like when someone does achieve something because I coach recreational most like mostly on a more regular basis so Mm -hmm. for them they're literally just doing forward rolls cartwheels like jumping on the trampette they're not doing anything crazy they're not even doing competitions so for me it's like when they achieve like a cartwheel or even like maybe the hardest thing they'll do is like a cartwheel with no hands and and they're just so happy and it's just like that just makes me so happy and yeah so I just think it doesn't need to be these crazy like outrageous goals it's just like the sport can make people happy at all different levels and just to be a part of that and then again with like choreography I do choreograph for more elite gymnasts or I do my workshops with more elite gymnasts so again with them just being able to help people pursue their dreams and just be a small part of it um yeah just love it and I do just love the sport in general yeah in kind of a way it's giving back as well I guess like we talked about before giving back to the sport and yeah and the yeah. way that other people has helped you yeah and I feel like I've learned so much like in quite a unique way like obviously doing it for quite a long time longer than like a lot of gymnasts go on for also having the college experience um I think I've got like quite a lot to of wisdom to pass on <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely no for sure and I thought it was so fun that you mentioned the stunt um stunt work that you've done as well I think that's super yeah. cool I was really intrigued when I read that um what is that like I mean how did you first get into doing stunts as well on the side um so I got so lucky um for the Wonder Woman that's coming out December I think we literally filmed okay. it like years ago now like two years um oh. I got really lucky they just found me on Instagram because they needed people that could like swing and um mm-hmm. so they were looking and they particularly needed like mixed race or or black and so then they found me on Instagram and um it was to double an Amazon so um they're actually so tall so first of all I was just going to come in just to sort of help set up the scenes because I was a lot shorter um mm-hmm. but luckily I've got these long arms so when I was swinging I think I looked taller than I am and um in the end I was like the best sort of double they could find so I just sort of <laughs> fell into that one and was on that for a good few months um so it's yet to come out which is like the first thing I worked on it's probably gonna be like one of the later things I get to see um but it was cool it was quite like a different experience from what I expected I've done like adverts and stuff okay. before and um it's definitely more intense and it's actually like it is a like obviously it's hard work but it's yeah it's just more intense yeah. than you imagine but at the end of the day it's like really rewarding to be a part of like a team and then obviously you're creating this mm-hmm. um movie or like or tv show at the end of it um so that was like my yeah. first little taster um and then I've got like another friend who he does it and um and then he sort of mentioned me for another role um so I got to audition for that one and then um I got that one so yeah and then just from there like I guess word of mouth and just like more people um mm-hmm. hearing about me so yeah it's been really cool so obviously at the moment my skill level is just like gymnastics um so when I retire I'll definitely want to go out and branch out into like martial arts mm-hmm. and all the other sports that can help me to further my stunt career yeah because it's I mean I guess it's a similar to gymnastics in some way or is it completely different like because obviously you need to be flexible I guess and all of these things that you get from gymnastics but is it the same type of moves or it's completely different um I would say for the most part it's pretty different um Mm -hmm. it depends on like what the stunt is like you could have a stunt like that's very gymnasticky but like you could literally be like flipping around or you could have one that was like in water or you could have one involving fire or jumping out of buildings and stuff like that so or in a harness um so yeah, I think it's it's very different from like um, film to film or from TV show to TV show. Okay. Um, but the good thing with gymnastics is obviously you're used to like all that, all eyes on you. So when <laughs> you are, there's like so many people in the room when you're doing a take and obviously all eyes are on you. It's like three, two on action. So I think that from gymnastics, when it's the same sort of intensity, that also prepared me. 
um, for getting into stunts. The stunts. Yeah, that's super cool. I mean, I'm definitely gonna look out for, um, yeah, for Wonder Woman. I think when this episode comes out, it's already out the movie. So maybe some people that are listening have already seen you. Oh, yeah, they might have. Movie. Um, so <laughs> yeah, you've done so a good job. Same. You won't recognize me because obviously I'm doubling. <laughs> Um, but yeah, then also well, on Netflix, um, on December, I think, 23rd, um, there's a okay. movie called The Midnight Sky um, that we were in space. So I was doubling um, an actress called Tiffany Boone in that one. So um, okay. I think that um, I might even end up seeing that before Wonder Woman. But either way, really, really cool okay. to be a part of both of them. <laughs> Of course, we're going to have a look to see if we can spot them. Like you said, you're doubling, but <laughs> maybe we can tell when you're the one doing doing the moves. <laughs> Just floating around in that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so obviously you have a lot of things going on, you know, with the stunts and with your elite gymnastics and coaching, but whenever um, you have a bit of free time, what else do you, do you like to do? Um, so I'm engaged. So, well, mm-hmm. now our wedding is going to be in 2022. So we kind of have a lot planned already because it was going to be next year. Um, but I still like to scroll through Pinterest and just get more inspiration for that. <laughs> um, obviously, we are in lockdown again. So this year, like there hasn't been many opportunities for much. But I basically just like okay. to hang out with my friends. I love going for nice dinners or it's like bars. I love going to the cinema. Um, love a bit of online shopping, a bit of Netflix. Yeah, it's just a normal <laughs> Okay, a bit about everything. <laughs> a bit of everything, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, as you know as well, this podcast is really about sharing um, the different and unique stories of professional athletes to show that, you know, everyone's road is different, but you're really a good example that if you never give up, you can truly achieve your dream. Um, so for the people who are listening to this episode and that have big dreams, but might be, you know, on the verge of giving up or not sure of how to actually get there, Um, what's one piece of advice that you would give them? I would say, obviously, we've kind of covered this already, but I would say write it down. And then especially if you're not sort of sure of how to get there, then you could also just Mm -hmm. break it down into more short-term goals. Um, Because sometimes having your big long-term goal written down is a bit daunting. So you don't need Mm -hmm. to have that written down. You could just do, you could do monthly, whether it's a vision board or whether it's literally like a post-it note that you stick somewhere and just have those small short-term goals. Um, and then also, like, I think we have covered all of this, but I think it's all important um, okay. having that <laughs> s- circle around you and those people that also believe in you and that are going to encourage you. Like, if there's someone that's dragging you down and that if you talk to them, they constantly leave you feeling, like, in a bad negative space, then probably need to cut them out of your life. Um, like, it, it, they say, isn't it, I think it's, like, the five people you spend the most time with or something like that have, like, a massive okay. effect on you, so... Um, really just looking at who your circle is are they people that are encouraging you and like making you feel inspired and motivated Um, and then just like it's much easier said than done but just believe in yourself and you literally get one life so go for it and um, kind of what happened with me like are you going to regret if you don't even try let alone if you succeed so yeah just live Mm -hmm. life with no regrets that's awesome really and even if you said some of it before I mean it's worth repeating because that's important stuff to remember so that's thank, you. Good. thank <laughs> you for thank you for sharing um one last question um what was the last thing that you maybe watched or that you read like a book a show um a tv show whatever it is um that you felt inspired by and that maybe you think all of us should check out as well Ooh, so I read this book called girl woman other by Bernadine Evaristo and um okay. yeah and then normally I'm like well this is fiction but normally I'm just like full-on like reading sort of crime fiction like stay in my lane I know what I like to read mm-hmm. um, my sister <laughs> got me this and um it was so good I think it's it's kind of like just shows you oh how do I describe it like it it goes back and like all the stories intertwine but um it's mm-hmm. it inspired me just because it just shows you like how where people have come from to start with and like how they progressed and then also just like opens your eyes to like different types of people and broadening people's horizons um so yeah I don't know it's kind of hard to describe but it definitely inspired me (laughs) and I do recommend it and it's yeah it's a good one it's different it's not like inspirational in the sense of like 
other books but I think it, it just opens your mind mm-hmm. that's what I would say and it just came to my head when you asked the question yeah not like a self-help book but a different type of inspiration yeah okay I know why I've put my finger on it now because every single okay. person <laughs> in that book is like very much themselves and they follow mm-hmm. what they want to do and yeah they're quite headstrong women some of them have like different times when they're not um but yeah it all comes together quite quite nicely yeah but just the little okay. stories inside are quite inspirational okay and you said it was called what sorry it was girl girl woman other girl woman other okay gonna try to put that title as well for anybody who wants to check it out perfect thank you and um if anybody who's listening wants to get in contact with you or maybe follow you your journey um what's the best place to to do so um i am on twitter and instagram it's at danusha francis and then on facebook Mm -hmm. it is i think it's facebook.com forward slash danusha Danusha francis noosh um a little bit on tiktok but not really okay (laughs) i'd say instagram and twitter and facebook definitely (laughs) biggest ones okay yeah Yeah, maybe tiktok we dabble yeah we dabble in tiktok here okay (laughs) okay a bit then (laughs) i'll see if i'll I'll find your account there as well (laughs) yeah I posted yeah. a video the other day for the first time since the first lockdown, so. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Worth having a look at least. <laughs> That's cool. Try and say cool, you know, like the kids are yeah, all on TikTok, aren't exactly. they? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I actually don't have TikTok myself, so, but yeah, I'll try to, try to see if I can find it. It is actually entertaining. <laughs> like, posting videos okay. is quite an ordeal, but just, like, scrolling through, there's a lot of, like, entertainment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not posting it yourself. I, I could probably no. do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much. You've been super generous with your time and everything. It's been really a pleasure um, speaking with you. And like I said so many times already, but you really are, you know, an example of someone who just had this childhood dream and never give up on it. And um, yeah, look at where you are today. So it's it's super inspiring. And we uh, we really appreciate you coming on here and sharing it with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a really good interview as well. I feel like you did so much good research. So thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was super good.